Hello, in this video we're going to go over uh, analyzing pivots and how pivots are related to linear independence uh, of rows and columns of a matrix. So let A be a matrix. The dimension of the row space is equal to the number of pivot entries of the echelon form of A. Furthermore, the non-zero rows of the echelon form form a basis for row space and the dimension of the column space is equal to the number of pivot entries basically the same thing of the echelon form of A furthermore the pivot columns of A form a basis for column space of A so notice that the, the, the difference here so here for column space you'll have to look at pivot columns of A but here you'll have to look at um, rows of echelon form so that's the difference. Okay, so I'll go over the sketch of proof of this theorem. I want to show that the row space would be spanned by the rows of the echelon form and it would be a basis. So here is the idea of the proof and this would not be like a complete proof but it would give you the main ideas of the proof. So one thing is that if I say A sub E is a, an echelon form of A then it is not very difficult to see and this was you know, this is in fact in one of your homework assignments that the row space doesn't change when I apply uh, these row operations so if I apply row operations the row space does not change and this was a homework assignment so now what that means is that the row space of the echelon form is the same as the row space of A now if you look at the echelon form a bunch of the vectors at the bottom are going to be zero so because I'm trying to find a basis I can ignore those and the vectors on top that are not zero I will have to show those vectors form a basis now they are of course spanning because row space and this is the echelon form row space of the echelon form is by definition the span of these vectors so they are spanning all I need to show is that they are also linearly independent so how do we show they are linearly independent let's say c1 ea1 all the way to crar is zero i would like to show that all the coefficients are zero if you look at a1 the way it works is that the echelon form works is that a1 has a non-zero leading entry and everything below that is zero so let's say that entry is perhaps lambda now, when I multiply C1A1 plus etc., there is one entry that I would get C1 times lambda. So when I multiply this one by C1, this one by C2, etc., there is only one entry that has C1 lambda. So C1 lambda must be zero, and we know that lambda is the leading leading entry of the first row. Uh, what that means is that C1 must be 0. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that lambda is the first entry. I'm saying that it's the leading non-zero entry. So that means C1 must be 0. So this uh, vector would disappear, and then you can just repeat the same argument and then show that all of the CIs must be 0. So this means all of the CIs must be 0, which means A1 through AR are in fact linearly independent. So A1 through AR are linearly independent but we know they are spanning by definition so therefore they form a basis for the row space for uh, the row space of A sub E which we argued that it is in fact the same as the row space of A now for the column space the columns are not necessarily column space doesn't necessarily remain the same I will give you an example in a few minutes uh, but the linear dependence remains the same so here is the argument that you can make uh, for column spaces this is going to be a little bit more complicated but still it's not that difficult so if you look at the columns let's say the columns are b1 b2 all the way to b uh, m um, let's say you have a few of these columns that are linearly dependent what I'm going to show is that linear dependence doesn't change so if this let's say the first second and third column are linearly dependent when you apply the row operations they would remain linearly dependent and since linear operations can be reversed row operations can be reversed linear dependence remains the same so if you have b1 plus 2b2 
minus b3 equals 0. When you apply row operations, you're applying the same operation to each of these, which means, let's say your uh, b1 is x, y, z, your b2, I'll just give you examples, let's say this is x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, and x3, y3, z3. So let's say this plus twice that minus that is zero. Now, when you apply row operations, let's say you add the first row to the second row. So what do we get? We get x1 and then we get x1 plus y1. So because it's homogeneous, the equation remains the same. On the other side, we'll get still the same number zero. So this guy, x2 plus y2, uh, z2, is also going to be zero because when you're applying the uh, thinking about the augmented matrix since the uh, constants are all zero nothing changes on the constant side so therefore they would remain linearly dependent so if you start from a bunch of vectors uh, columns that are linearly dependent they would re remain linearly dependent and vice versa which means if you look at the columns of a sub e if you find some of them that are linearly independent, they must have been linearly independent at the beginning. But if you look at the um, if you look at the pivot columns of A, A sub E, they are linearly independent. And the argument is very similar. If you look at A sub E, the pivot columns are the ones that you have non-zero and then zero below that. So again, non-zero zero below that if you start from the very last one that is the pivot column and again there could be some zeros here and apply the same argument you know that the pivot columns are a sub e are linearly independent now if they are linearly independent that means the pivot columns of a are also linearly independent and we argued that the number of linearly independent columns doesn't change so if you look at uh, a bunch of vectors in a that are linearly independent a bunch of columns then they would remain linearly independent in a sub e so what that means is that if you go back and look at the columns of a that were pivot columns those would be a basis so that's like the idea of the proof now let me give you a couple of um, an, an example one on row space and one on uh, column space so here is an example find a basis for the row space of a and the column space of a so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this matrix we're gonna apply row operations and we end up with an echelon form and then we use the previous theorem okay so we'll start from 0 1 3 0 negative 1 negative 1 3 negative 1 one two zero one 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 zero so we're going to make these two entries zero by taking the third row and adding second row to that and taking the fourth row and adding the second row to that and then i will have to swap the first and second row so let's do that here so swap the first row and the second row to just get the negative one on top negative 1, negative 1, 3, negative 1, 0, 1, 3, 0. So those are the first and second row. The third row I'm adding, so that would be 1, 3, 0. And I'm adding the second row to the fourth row, so 0, 0, 4, negative 1. Right there, you know that the first, uh, second and third, column, third row are the same, so we'll subtract the second row from the third row we will get negative 1 negative 1 3 negative 1 0 1 3 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 4 negative 1 okay so right there it's almost echelon form except I have to swap the third row and the fourth row and if I do that I will get so first row remains intact negative 1 negative 1 3 negative 1 second row the same I have to swap the third and fourth row so 0 0 4 negative 1 and then zeros are at the bottom 
if you look at the row space so a basis for the row space of this matrix is the three non-zero vectors in the echelon form so negative one negative one three negative one zero one three zero and finally zero zero four negative one so this is the basis for the row space a basis for the column space would be the pivot columns of A and not um, echelon form. So I'll have to first identify the pivot columns here. The pivot columns are this one, this one, and this one. So the first three columns are pivot columns. So I'll have to look at these three, not for the echelon form. So if you look at that, it would be 0, negative 1, 1, 1, and then the next one is 1, negative 1, 2, 1. And then finally the last one is 3, 3, 0, 1. 3, 3, 0, 1. So these three form a basis for the column space. Now notice that the first three rows of A are in fact linearly dependent. If you look at the first three rows, of A, they're actually linearly dependent because we ended up with a zero here. So the first three rows of A are linearly dependent. So if you look at the corresponding rows in A, they are not a basis. And if you look at the if you look at the columns of uh, the first three columns of echelon form, they have zero at the bottom. So they do not form a basis for the column space of A because they have a zero at the bottom. But column space of A doesn't have necessarily all zeros at the bottom. They have ones, some of them. So this brings me to the next, so I'm done with this problem. This brings me to the next remark. This is an important one. Note that to find a basis for the column space, you, we must look at the pivot columns of A and not those of the echelon form. But to find a basis for row space of A, we must look at rows of the echelon form that are with uh, that have pivot entries, basically the non-zero rows of row space, and not, not those of A. Okay, the rank of a matrix A denoted by rank of A is the dimension of the row space, which is the same as the dimension of the column space. So what we saw is that pivot columns give you a basis for the column space, pivot rows, the rows that are non-zero, give you a basis for the uh, row space. Now, both of them are the same as the number of pivot entries. So that means the dimension of the column space and the dimension of the row space are in fact the same. Now when you swap rows and columns, there's actually a name for that matrix. That's called the transpose. So the transpose of, a of an n, m by n matrix A is an n by m matrix denoted by a, uh, a superscript T, whose ij entry is the ji entry of A. For every matrix A, we have rank of A is equal to rank of A transpose. So basically the idea is what we just proved, what we just uh, saw. So rank of A is the dimension of the column space of A, which is the number of pivot columns of A by the theorem that we just proved. And this is the number of pivot entries. But the number of pivot entries of A is the same as the number of non-zero rows of the echelon form. Of, so there's multiple of them so of an echelon form of A. But that's exactly the same as the uh, dimension of the column uh, of the row space dimension of the row space of a but dimension of the row space of a is the same as dimension of the column space of a transpose because rows of a are columns of a transpose so row space of a is exactly the same as um, column space of a transpose and that's rank of a transpose so rank of a and rank of a transpose are the same 
the dimension of the row space and dimension of column space are in fact the exact same thing. So that's an interesting fact about every matrix. Now, given that, we'll do one more example. Find a basis for the subspace of R4 generated by these four uh, vectors. Now, you could take these four vectors, put them in a column of the matrix, do, do all of those row reductions, or put them in rows. If you put them in columns, make sure you go back and look at the original matrix because of what we discussed. If you put them in rows, you can just look at the echelon form. So I will often put them in rows because then I don't have to wor worry about having to go back and look at the original matrix. So I will do that. 1, 5, 2, 3, 1, 1, negative 2, 0. Okay, so we'll go ahead and make these three entries 0 by applying R2 plus R1, R3 minus R1, and R4 minus R1. So we'll apply these three operations. So 1, 2, 0, 1. So I'm adding the first row to the second row. So that would be 3, 2, 2. Subtracting the first row from the, from the third row. So 0, 3, 2, 2. Okay, so that's nice. That's also going to disappear. And then subtracting the first row from the third row. So that would be 0, minus 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 2. Okay, so I'm multiplying the first row by negative 1, adding to the third row. So negative 1, uh, negative 2, and negative 1. Okay, so I get that. Now I will um, take the uh, sec third row, make that 0, and see what goes on here. So I'm going to do 1, 2, 0, 1. Um, so row 3 minus row 2. And I'm going to swap the row 3 and row 4. So 0, 3, 2, 2. 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so that's nice. Now I'm going to, uh, I guess, use that to make this one 0. So we will do R2 minus uh, plus 3R3. Three three. And then we can swap R2 and R3 just to make sure that the matrix becomes an echelon form. So 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 0. So I multiply this by, by 3. I add it to that. So that's negative 4. And that is negative 1. And then I have 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So as we see, there are three rows. There are three pivot entries here. Three rows. So um, a basis is... 1, 2, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, and 0, 0, negative 4, negative 1. So um, you can also check this one by making sure that these three vectors are linearly independent, which they are because they are, uh, they have different, uh, they, they are in an echelon form. And also they, uh, they form a basis, meaning that those four vectors are in the span of these. Okay, and the last thing we're going to talk about is the idea of a null space. And the null space is uh, given by this, by this expression. So let's say you have a matrix A whose columns are V1 through Vn in Rm. So of course, there are N columns and M rows. That's why V1 through Vn are columns and they're all in Rm. The set of all vectors v of the form x1 through xn in Rn for which the linear combination is 0 is a subspace of Rn. So how do we show subspace? We show the uh, subspace, we will use the subspace criteria. So we will use the subspace criteria. Okay, so first, if you look at 0, v1, all the way to 0 Vn, that is just 0. Uh, so this means 0, 0, 0 is in, um, in the null space. 
So let's say set for now because we don't know it's a space yet. So it's in the given set. Now assume there are two vectors in there. So assume sum of xj vj is 0, j equals 1 to n, and sum of yj vj is also 0, j equals 1 to n, and some scalar c is selected. Then I'll have to show that the sum of xj plus yj vj is also 0. So I'll take that sum. This is equal to the sum of xj vj plus sum of yj vj. Now both of these are 0 because of the assumption. So this is 0 plus 0 which is 0. Um, and then we also take a look at sum of cxj vj. This would be j equals 1 to n. This would be c times the sum of xj vj. j equals 1 to n. And this is c times 0, which is also 0. So that means the given set is closed under addition and uh, scalar multiplication. So by the subspace criterion we know that zero is in there, we know it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication, therefore it is a subspace. Now there's a name for the subspace which is uh, the null space. So the subspace defined in the previous example is called the null space or the kernel of A. And the notation is often this or this one. So either kernel or the null space of A. You could put parentheses or not. Sometimes if there is like ambiguity I would use parentheses. If there is like kernel of product of two matrices I will definitely put a parentheses to make it more clear. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end of this video, and I will see you in the next video.